2023 to 530. Um, before we get started with the uh, agenda, I'd like to move um, item four, uh, which is executive session till after Chris Murphy gets here. The chair of the board gets here. He's going to be just a little late today. Um, and we'll go now move into the uh, call the meeting to order and move into uh, item number one, Pledge of Allegiance. Mm -hmm. If I could say on public comment, because uh, of the new security procedures that are in for Zoom meetings, you would need to go down to reactions at the bottom bar. And uh, raise, you know, use the hand motion so that I would know you want to speak, and then I would unmute you. But we would not be able to see your camera, uh, just hear your voice. So just caution as we go into public comment. And so with that, we'll get started with public comment. If there's anyone on Zoom that wishes to speak, Go down to the reaction bar at the bottom and raise your hand. I am currently not seeing any raised hands. I don't know if we want to give them a minute and still not seeing any raised hands. I just saw somebody come in fine. No. He's in, but oh, Betsy, um, your item number three. So I will unmute you when we get to item three. And anyone with public comment, go to the reaction bar at the bottom and hit the hand symbol and we would see it. Not seeing any raised hands. Okay, seeing none, we can move to item three. Let's see, I am going to ask you to unmute and then you'll be able to speak if you could introduce yourself and tell the board why you're here. Yes, hi everybody, thank you so much. Um, I appreciate your time. I'm the director of Bennington County Head Start, which is part of United Counseling Service, also part of United Children's Services. And I'm here because I have exciting news for Pownall. We have received federal funding to replace that building. It's been a wonderful partnership for over 26 years, and we wanna move forward with replacing that building. Jim, I did have a couple of slides I wanted to show. Is that possible at all to be able to show a couple um, of? It used to be under the old security. Um, you know, if I, if the caution, if I um, can share, allow you to share your screen, but I'll have to be uh, very diligent to shut it off if we run into problems. You should be able to share your screen now. Thank you. Do you see that now? It says your step. There you go. Yep. Perfect. Thank you. If I can get this to go to slide. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so what I thought I would share with you a little bit is kind of the history of what we've been able to put together in Pownall. We, you know, as a Head Start program, we started in 1965. And we've had a wonderful cooperative relationship with Pownall since 1995. And we've served over 500 preschoolers and their families at this site for over 28 years. Um, we also have four staff there. And so um, some of those staff have come from Pownall in the past. Um, we have a very strong partnership with the elementary school. We have partnership for nutrition services, for children with special needs, with kindergarten transition, transition camps. And, um, and we have been just really pleased with the work that we've been able to do there over this time. So we've also been able to help build new playgrounds with federal funding um, um, on the Pownall Elementary School grounds, which has been really um, delightful for both the elementary school kids and the preschool children. Um, we've had several folks from Pownall participate um, in lots of different ways in our program. We have Tara Parks, who was a past policy council um, and 
um, resident and now is, she works for the town of Pownall, participate in our program. And we thought we'd just share with you real quickly some of the quotes that we have from people that um, you may know that work directly in the Pownall school or in the town of Pownall. You know, we have Deb Bernard and Christy Keir, who are both elementary um, kindergarten teachers, talk about the partnership in Pownall and how much it is meant to them to be able to get the kids really ready for kindergarten once they leave our program. And also um, from our Pownall Elementary nurse, um, school nurse, also had her children um, participate in our program and really, really um, added to both um, the policy council and the development of the playground when we were doing that, that project too. So, you know, 1995, we placed this building on the Pownall Elementary School grounds. We've had a longstanding lease with the ground lease there, and it's been a great building. But as you can see in the next slide, um, time has taken its toll on the building. Um, it is right now on piers, and it is slowly but surely beginning to disintegrate. And the feds have helped us with um, providing us with some funding in order to replace the building. And um, we're under a fairly tight time frame for that funding, um, but that's what we're here today to be able to go um, forward with the planning around that land lease. So the new building will um, be slightly um, larger, but basically sit on the same footprint. It will be blues and grays as right now, what our color zones are, what we're thinking about having it look like but it will have a little bit more of a structure around it so that it has more of a residential feel than just a box sitting there on the ground. So we're really pleased with the design of it, but it will be a modular facility. We plan to be able to put in um, frost walls, be able to um, bring this facility in within three different pieces and be able to put it in place within six to eight weeks once we start the construction. So it will be minimal impact for what's going on there. We've really planned a lot around making sure that this works within the school grounds and um, during the summertime, if we can get this building in place by then. So it will have a classroom on one side and then additional classroom on the other side for infants and toddlers. It also will allow us to have some more office space for staff. And um, since we do do a lot with children that have a variety of disabilities, it will have some space that we're able to work with all the different providers to provide those types of services too. So, how much will it cost? Well, um, it won't cost the town anything. It won't cost the supervisory union anything. The costs are being covered by the feds and also by a commitment from United Children's Services. So, um, but these funds are time limited. We only have them for the next um, 12 months at the most. And we really wanna move this project forward so that we can make sure that we are able to keep those funds and be able to put them to support this project. We anticipate this project costing over $700,000. So it's you know not an inexpensive um, building that we're putting in place, um, but I think it will be one that will serve the Pownall community very well. And um, our goal um, is to have it open by September of 2003. That's why we're here at the school board to kind of see if we can move the land lease um, forward in whatever way you think is best to do that. So how can you help us? We hope that you'll vote yes and um, we can continue to work forward um, with planning services for Pownall and Bennington residents. I'm going to stop sharing now. Thank you. Yep. If I could speak to this, Betsy, um, Betsy and I have been back and forth with our attorney and their attorney trying to avoid um, going to a public vote, but we're only allowed to do a three year lease. The federal requirement is a 10, 10 year lease. So our attorney advised us the only way to do more than three years is you have to go for a public vote. Um, the estimate range about what four thousand dollars is the cost for a public vote? Round figures. We would propose that we split the cost of doing a special election, um, and uh, I asked that the board would vote to move forward with us having our attorney draft the language for the vote, and then um, we'll 
bring it back probably at a special meeting for you to see the language before then we send it to the clerk to have it worn for a meeting which will take 30 to 45 days um, just like when we do our our budget and then once the vote is held then there is uh, a hold of 30 days after that in case anyone challenges the results of the vote so you know even if you voted tonight on a very aggressive uh timeline it, it, it's it's uh two or three months before we could have a vote which it, and then throw in their construction time timeline uh it's going to be tight it's a district-wide vote uh it's a district-wide vote because you are now all one district it's not just Powell. so um if there's any questions for best here if not um i would ask um to make a motion that we instruct uh, our SBSU attorney to draft the motion, uh, the warning motion. It will be a warning, warning for a public vote. For a public vote mm -hmm. to enter into a 10 year lease agreement. I'll make that motion. I'll second it. You just mm -hmm. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? Extensions. Thank you, Betsy. You have your first yes vote. Okay, that. very good. Thank you so much. Appreciate everybody's and, time. And uh, thank we'll, you. We'll contact our attorney tomorrow to get that moving as quickly as possible. Okay, very good. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, so moving on to item. Can I, can I have sure? Can we take one other item out of? Uh, and we don't need to amend the agenda. We're just going to take something out of order because our Director of Operations has informed me that she needs to, she's also a president of a parent teacher organization in town and has a six o'clock meeting. Yeah. So we can let uh, item number seven, if the board wishes. Yes. Is it okay? Um, I'm totally cutting in line. So for those who I have not met, hi, I'm Holly Anderson. I'm the Director of um, Facilities Management and Operations. Uh, my valley with this construction, um, but I also oversee uh, food service and transportation. So I'm having a lot, a lot of fun. Um, uh, one of the things that is on your agenda for review and comment is um, the Bennington Elementary roof, not the entire thing, just the section on the east side that's on the two-story elevation. The board um, did hear last month about the buckets yeah. in the classroom and the leak, so. Yeah. But I knew it was in progress, but if you could speak to that. Yeah, definitely. And um, after review and comment uh, and spending a lot of time walking on the roof, uh, I, my sense is it's past the point of being able to be patched. Uh, so I worked with Director uh, Gordon on how fast we can use this year's funds in addition to some funds that we have saved for this exact purpose to, to be able to re-roof the entire thing this summer. Those were the, and in the packet there were two bids? Two or? bids. Uh, we reached out to a number of different other uh, contractors and either it was too far or they're too busy. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you guys are aware of the, the market right now between Mm -hmm. yeah, all of the things yeah. um, supply chain. So uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, it's the roof that's adjoining the uh, elevator uh, where the new elevator is going to be constructed so that we can have access to both floors. So at least the elevator together. Yeah. Um, Did you do have a recommendation on it? I do. The low bidder uh, was Doxy Roofing. I worked with both Doxy and Vermont Roofing extensively. They have a, a great leadership team. They have good workers. Uh, I have no problems uh, about uh, making a recommendation for that season. Questions or if someone wants to make a recommendation? Where does the where does the roof right, fit into the? Well, I mean, obviously, it's a need to get done. Yeah. Um, and that was that that's clear. I I would love to know, especially with I think the two buildings in Bennington, the overall need 
as far as the buildings building assessments. I've asked Holly to generate for me that then we can present to the boards one year plan, five year plan, 10 year plan for all the physical plants in the district. I mean, that that is the luxury that we now have with Holly's position. Right. So you're not quite ready to present that to the board? I'm, not, I'm happy. I'm happy to uh, talk a little bit about it because there's two sort of parallel strings, actually three. And then maybe simplifying it with a one year plan, five year plan, 10 year plan. But no, I, we need this plan priorities for uh, when we go into every budgeting session with Brene, and we're not just reacting to putting out problems, but what's our long range planning for these aging buildings? Right. Um, so right now we're going through a process with the state to do uh, overall facilities assessment. Um, and they go in and we've been going with the, the different buildings with the facilities managers to look at all of the infrastructure the um, building envelope, the structure, the <coughs> and ventilation systems, uh, all, all of the pieces and parts of the building. Uh, it's been pretty comprehensive, and I look forward to seeing what they say. Uh, the other piece of that is the money we have from uh, the federal government through the ESSER funds that are directed specifically toward uh, HVAC improvements to bring um, occupant temperature range between 60 and 70, and also make sure that air exchange is at the, the appropriate um, industry standard rate through ASHRAE. So those, those two things are happening. The other thing I'm putting together at the request of Superintendent Kalkin is um, what do we see as uh, priorities over the next 10 to 20 years, right? What are the immediate needs like? What, what do we need to do right now? Um, and I'm, uh, I'm sure everyone that I work with is sick of hearing this, but um, we're uh, July 1st, uh, the state of Vermont is making it illegal. Not We are no longer allowed to uh, purchase linear G fluorescence or any sort of fluorescent lamp uh, in the state of Vermont. So when when that happens in parallel efficiency, Vermont will no longer incentivize LED uh, technology. So all of those funds will go bye-bye. So the, in the immediate future, we want to take advantage of the incentives and the opportunities. Uh, we we have um, now ordered about 12,000 uh, linear tube LEDs to replace fluorescence in the district. Um, overall, in the SDSU, it's going to save about $65,000 a year in just kilowatt hours. So that those are examples of like things we need to do immediately to um, take advantage. And also things obviously that are immediate are um, leaky roofs, broken windows, um, obvious. obvious. To, to Scott's point, it's my intent to bring to this committee the plan of your buildings and what we, you know, what we're seeing is the glaring deficiencies in all these buildings. So, and as soon as we possibly can. So, yeah, and it's uh, you. You told me you have a draft and. Ready to share it with me. Yeah, we just not. And I think from my from my perspective, it's more than just about the 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 maintenance and upkeep, but it's the learning today is different than it was five years ago. It's different than it was 20 years ago. It's different than it was 50 years ago. And how how can we what do we need to do to make the learning environment appropriate for the students of today? And if it's not. What would it take for us to do that? And it might mean being bold, but I'd like to know what it's like, what we need to do to be bold. And then we can either work back from there or lean into it. But I just haven't gotten a great feeling for what that is yet. So Holly was at a conference last week on Burlington for all the, but it was what, and uh, speaking of bold, she sent me a video clip of a brand new school being built. <laughs> So, um, so the, the the conference is one that I've, I've attended for many years. And it's all about better buildings by design, and not looking at just how we use our buildings today or how we use our buildings ten years ago. But what do we foresee in ten years? We'll just foresee, and we really need to be especially K through twelve facilities. We need to be building seven generation facilities, or or if that is an ideal. Um, when you see uh, high school had basically our high school with mm -hmm. all the same problems, 
all the same building envelope uh, uh, concerns. And they went through uh, a planning process with USDA Rural Development to procure funds to go through into a phased renovation of their facilities, understanding that they, they have some structural complications and, and there are some impediments, but they, they had a whole uh, presentation on how they got from point A to point B. And that is what I would very much like to go to. I, I had a conversation last week with a state representative and um, it was it was his feelings that while there's a moratorium that was put into place, I don't remember how long ago it was, that there's no new buildings funded by the state, no, no pathway for it. Buildings don't last forever and they're realizing that that can't go on forever. And so the more we can think about what it would take to be bold and being ready for when that is, is lifted, I think I, I'm, I'm inspired by and I think we need to be thinking about. Yes. I'll remind you about eight minutes before your next Yes. So. And it's only like three minutes that way, so. <laughs> <laughs> they can't start without me any. <laughs> we still need a motion on the roof. So the LEDs that you purchased, they weren't replacements, they were actual units? So they're they're just the uh, land replacements. So if you have like the metal housing, and they and you can just swap them out. Yep. Um, and the great thing about the technology now is that uh, like the electricity comes in. Excuse me for I just I love this stuff so much. And there's a ballast, right? And uh, the great thing about these lamps are that they have a ballast bypass, so that um, you can plug and play. They're one and done. And then when the ballast uh, fails, because a lot of the infrastructure is old, it can just be rewired right to the lamp. And so the lamp stays in place. Um, and the, the, we started with about 11,000. And Efficiency Vermont recognized uh, the opportunity they have in our school. So uh, it was about $85,000 to purchase all these LEDs. And they, uh, as soon as they are installed and inspected, which um, in, is in various stages in different buildings. Um, we will be reimbursed 100, percent so it will be zero tax cost rates. You have to <laughs> can't have a mix, right, of the LEDs and the fluorescent. You absolutely can. Um, one of the concerns is the uh, fluorescents just use so much more energy and create so much more heat, mm -hmm. um, whereas the LEDs don't. And the the color temperature, the color rendering is different. Uh, so if you go, for example, into Molly Stark, the, they have uh, 5,000 K lights, and they are like, you could do surgery on it. And, um, and, and that's not the case with these, these new lamps. So you're welcome. So it is, you'll see it on future agenda items as soon as I see it. So what we need now is a motion to accept the recommendation to award the contract to Doxy Roofing and all project expenditures in coordination with the Director of Finance for both current fiscal year funds and end reserve funds needed to cover the scope of work and associated cost as outlined in the project estimated cost summary and award to Doxy Roofing for $275,000. Yeah, quick question on that. <clears throat> between the two, um, between the two proposals, uh, Vermont roofing built in the contingency that they get to build more. I don't see that in Doxies. Is that part of the selection process, and or will there be an overrun clause brought to us? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you for asking. I, uh, you can't measure what you can't see, right? So. Sure. So when uh, in, in the sheet, you'll see I got the quote, and then there's an additional contingency for any underlayment, uh, because until we rip the roof off, we won't be able to see how much is rotten. So I, I want to, I know that the lump sum is the amount of labor and material to replace the roof, and I don't know how much we have to replace underneath. My sense is about 10%, um, but it's hard to tell not knowing. Did that answer your question? Absolutely. Okay. Very well. Um, that's all. Second. Any discussion? One, one last question about that. Um, I know that they anticipate the date to be done, but is there any guarantee? Did you have anything that says if you're not done, then you need to do something? No. There's uh, no liquidated damages in the proposal. There's no. Um, 
okay. there's no like if, if they don't get it done in a particular time. Um, and as we start, uh, I I've always put together a schedule to make sure we have anticipated dates that they have to be like 50% complete, 75% complete. And should that change or there be some alteration, I'll start with that. I just want to make sure that this was the priority and not some other project. Oh, yeah. Um, well, and that's part of the main problem right now is there's so much work and there's so much federal money coming in is that contractors are busy, they're straight out, there's not enough of them, mm -hmm. and they're not hungry. So uh, getting getting competitive bids is um, is a challenge. Just one last question: Are the HVAC supposed to go in this summer? So the our Besser funds those HVAC projects. There's um, they're in different phases of construction yeah. design. So the middle school is on hundred percent right now, as is uh, Woodford. They're two different funding streams, but similar. We're anticipating Woodford. To be done this summer, we're, we're going through hoops with the agency of Ed to make sure we're doing all the right procurement steps. Yeah. So we're hoping, and I'm like, fingers, everything's crossed. So those are the two schools being done this summer. It's the middle school and the and Woodford, and then all of the other uh, elementary school dis school district buildings that had an energy efficiency upgrade in 2017. We're use you we we are reusing the existing ductwork that we already have putting in cooling clothes and the rooftop units and then going through and insulating. So it's um, it's a bigger bang for the buck. It's less intrusive. Um, but the it's design is slow down about that now. So that's not gonna the roof is not gonna the HVAC systems will not affect the roof. And okay. Does Woodford already have HVAC? <laughs> yes, we have an air conditioning not that much. Before we run out of time. Renee's got some things to add to the Yeah, no, so I just um be able to be able to take money out of reserve funding, we need a specific authorization from the board to do so. So my recommendation would be for us to get the contract with Doxy, get them started and use as much of this year's funding that I have. Um, we know that we have some breakage and some projects that were planned at Molly Stark that, that aren't gonna happen. I'm thinking we're probably gonna have about $150,000 that we can use towards this to get them started. Yeah. And then out of reserve funds, um, you all remember, those of you that were here when we were separate elementary districts, a lot of um, districts chose at times to put money into reserve funds. When we came together as the union, we started a new, uh, a new reserve fund that will serve all of our schools. but. The money that was raised individually remains specifically with those school districts or buildings. So um, the Bennington School District Capital Projects um, Reserve Fund has a balance of 150,000 to 61.63. So if the board would authorize us to access those funds as needed to complete this project, I think we'll be able to see it through with using this year's money and the reserve funds without yep. trying to tap into next year's. Put money. that into a motion for the board. To move on, it's got to make motion to access the reserve funds up to a complete project. So I'll make the motion to uh, use the reserve funds to complete the project as needed. Is this in addition to the motion that's already on the floor, or are we so, so I think it was it was kind of built yeah. in, but I just want to be specific because when the auditors come look at the minutes, and they're going to say, "Well, they didn't specific specifically so authorize." Amend the this motion money. on the floor to include mm -hmm. funding to, to first use the reserve fund. Is that we're going to use local funds first? The current current budget. Current funds. Okay, so the motion should be to use the local funds first, and then use the reserve funds to complete the project yes. if needed. I'll make the motion to which uh, is an amendment <laughs> where you're going to vote to amend the one that avoid so i think we should start start with the, uh, awarding the contract so i'd like to start okay. i'd be the first yes. to right. and, then then contract, and then we should have and then a, vote a second motion, motion. Second motion. Second. that's fine and we already had a we already motion. had a motion, and motion. Second. second so and on, on we were in discussion so all those in favor of the contract motion of the contract motion all of, any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so that's the first one. And then Jeff, 
I'll make the motion to use local funds to start the project and as needed to use reserve funds to complete the project. Happy to second that. In any discussion? Just one question. Um, you're talking about taking the funds from facilities. You're not thinking about adjusting line items to accommodate that need. Okay. Thank you. Any other discussion? All of those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Thank you. I'm sorry. Just let mine. No, okay. Thank, Thank you for explaining. Too. Yeah, you're welcome. I'm happy to. And answering that, finishing answering your question, it's a big question mark on when the other projects are going to happen. But we're working diligently. Stay tuned. Yeah, stay, stay tuned. tuned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so for consent agenda, do we we have to we can have a motion to accept to accept it? Yes. I just wasn't sure it said, didn't say action requested. So uh, option or item five on the agenda, the consent agenda, is the consent agenda. I make the motion to set the consent agenda as it stands. We'll get a second. I'll second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? And they do have a physical copy of the warrant that we can circulate for signatures. Thank you. Um, so we skipped item seven, we're on to item eight, finance. I uh, need a motion to accept the treasurer's report on the March. All right, motion to accept the treasurer's report. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Accepting the treasurer's report? Aye. <laughs> Any opposed? Any abstentions? Uh, so let's go into item nine. Superintendent's report. Um, but do, you, do you mind if we go? I know you heard your title, you don't mind waiting, right? I know. Okay, it's good. All right. <laughs> Are you sure? Well, I, heard, I heard you comment to Holly, you know, that she was jumping the line. So, um, can I share my screen? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Assistant Superintendent Laura McGraw, Director of Curriculum Construction and Assessment, Melissa Senecal, and Point Surface. Kate okay, Abbott are going to give you this update on grants. I'm going to allow them to share their screen. Okay. Thanks for having us. Uh, every year we provide you with an uh, update during grant season um, about uh, where we are in the process and, and this reflects um, this period of time. We as a district have a grant team um, that meets weekly. Uh, Renee Gordon is also part of the team, our director of finance, and then we have uh, a team of administrative assistants that sit with us as well. And uh, the information uh, that we're sharing you is just to give you an overview and much of it was shared in our community night um, as well that we had last month. Um, so it was also to summarize uh, this piece. So uh, big picture, uh, our, our, our major grant that we've been talking about is the ESSER grant. And the ESSER grant uh, is funding through the elementary and secondary school relief, emergency relief fund. And they were distributed in three allocations. <coughs> we are currently on uh, ESSER 2, which will expire um, on September 30th, 2023. And uh, you can see that the, the allocation for this particular ESSER grant. And we just, again, wanted to give you some highlights of uh, some of the investments in this grant. So ESSER 2, which will bring us until the end of next September, some of them you can see listed there include a lot of professional learning um, in zones of regulation, restorative practices, and uh, we pay a lot of our wonderful educators for, for professional learning that they do outside of their contracted time, and that's really important. Um, and we also are making a really big purchase based on recommendations of vetted resources for our new primary resources for ELA and math, and that's coming all from this money right here. So I'll give you more information um, about what those are in, in upcoming, but the money is coming from this grant, which is very exciting 
for us and the taxpayers. And then again, as for free, as a reminder, um, we have our, our allocation uh, for this particular uh, piece of ESSER. And again, you'll see a lot of uh, the similar investments with a few changes. I would say the biggest change that you'd see was a spoiler alert from our friend Holly that was right here, and that's construction. So the biggest addition that you'll see um, in ESSER 3 that will end that following September um, would be a lot of construction. So, um, the next round of grants, so this is, uh, so ESSER is um, uh, grants that have um, interesting expiration dates in the grant world. Um, a grant that uh, is uh, historically part of our district is the title grant. And uh, Title I is all about improving the academic achievement of the disadvantaged. Title II is about supporting effective instruction. Title IV is all about student support and academic enrichment. Um, our total title allocation um, is provided. And then a little piece of information to share. Uh, we had some questions recently about what school might mean, because they've seen that label. All of our schools in our district are school-wide schools. That means they meet the threshold of 40% low income. Um, this is a, a huge, massive effort every year to get every family to fill out uh, their forms and return them to us because, um, and as this is an important meeting to say this so that anyone that's watching, it's just really important um, uh, as you're completing your packets, your first day packets, to make sure that um, this form is filled out. And then we've also provided you with what um, the grant system provides Renee and I with our numbers after those forms are submitted. And we also wanted to highlight with, for you across the um, across the district uh, how um, different schools are using the money that's allotted uh, just to them. And uh, this is a collaboration with building administrators and your staff to make decisions. Again, you'll notice that most of the weight is on personnel. Uh, specifically reading um, interventionists or math interventionists and coaches. Uh, we also gave you just a little snippet, and you've heard us talk about these things before, of um, different uh, district investments that are then shared and tutoring, again, something we talked about over the course of the year, and we're lucky to have the partnership with the, our community partners, like the Tutorial Center, to help support this work. Um, a couple that we wanted to just highlight, um, the art and music teachers who get together uh, three or four times a year um, have Title IV investments, and it's all around building um, engagement with, with families. Um, the art teachers right now are planning events to engage parents in activities, and they're using this grant money to for the supplies uh, to engage families in different projects. Um, and, and then the music teachers um, are also uh, working with students around um, creating uh, opportunities to come together uh, and create something that can be shared. So just to give you some, some snippets about how title money is used. So our idea of the uh, grant is a federal grant that comes to our district for learners that have identified disabilities. Um, the amount of our idea B is about 1,400,000 and it goes from July 1 to June 30th each year and it is specifically for learners that qualify for IEP services. Some of our UED, USBU, ESD investments include um, our school psychologists, physical therapy services, audiology services, adaptive physical education, and some software um, such as Learning Ally, which is a reading software that we use for learners, <laughs> professional learning. So some of the work we're doing around inclusion and best practices with UDL also supported through this grant and extended your services for learners that require year-round instruction so they don't lose ground in the summer. And the other uh, grant that our that the student services kind of manages is we um, bill against Medicaid for learners that receive IT services that are medically Medicaid eligible. And we bill every month and then we receive a monthly uh, reimbursement for what's allowable. And um, some of the Medicaid based services are used, they're all used for preventing, preventing disabilities. So um, you do not need an IP to receive Medicaid based investments. 
So our UCS clinicians um, that provide clinical services are funded through Medicaid ideology, and then we can buy equipment that benefits all learners in a classroom. Our board certified behavioral analysts can work with children with and without IEPs, and they're partially funded through Medicaid to allow some of the time uh, to do preventative efforts. Our, some of our motor services, especially working in zones of regulation and teaching um, different ways of helping kids that need to move during the day are also funded through Medicaid. And vision services, we have a consultant that helps us with children that have some vision needs and they teach teachers how to really maximize the instructional environment. And our Medicaid clerks are funded through our Medicaid grant. And finally, uh, the, we partner with the Department of Health for our Medicaid administrative claiming program. So it's a little bit different than what uh, Kate described, but it is about being preventative and uh, the way that it's funded is um, unique and I'm constantly learning about, but there's something called a moment in time. And so in our buildings, if we have clinicians or counselors or nurses, they get a ping um, from, um, it's the University of uh, Massachusetts, thank you for that. <laughs> and they get a ping and says, this is your moment in time. And you need to log in and in that moment, you're logging what you're doing. And based on that, we get a dollar amount in return. That mon money is bundled and then we can write investments to get it against it. It has to be linked to our uh, district health and wellness plan, which is um, monitored by our district health and wellness team. Um, and so you can see some of the investments there that helps to uh, support our troop tutors, um, team coordinator stipends, like our lead nurse and um, counselors and clinicians. Uh, the SNAP membership for all, all of our district nurses comes out of this particular grant. And then um, the health and wellness team works on planning um, for events for learners. And so our goal every year is to give you some snippets um, during grant, we call this grant season. Um, right after budget season. Our goal is to give you um, some insight because right now again, we're writing our grants and the last uh, page in your packet highlights the event that we had this past, past month uh, where we invited the community to come together and learn more about the information similar to what we shared tonight um, to have conversations with us and provide feedback. And we also then shared as a reminder and anyone's watching tonight that we have right on our homepage and our website we have a link, a recovery link, where you can provide input. And under the About Us tab, there is a title link where you can also provide uh, information. And if anyone else has any ideas about any of the grants we shared, again, this is grant season, and we're um, always looking for feedback and ideas. And so thank you so much, again, just to give you an overview tonight. Thank you. Thanks for sharing. Thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, the next item is the 23-24 calendar. It is in your packet. Uh, just reminded the board uh, is allowed to input the calendar. It's drafted by the superintendent on a regional basis. Uh, the board do not actually vote on the calendar, uh, and that's by staff. Uh, highlights the calendar again. It, it's Similar to last year's, there's probably one less half day in January because the ski program doesn't start on the first Wednesday uh, as it did last uh, last year. Uh, so we'll back it up one to be one less. Because that, you know, I, I acknowledge that there's been some concerns about the half days, but uh, I find them very important to what we do in this in school district. The early release Wednesdays for SVSU students allows for teacher preparation, team meetings such as PLCs, uh, education support team, 504, IEP team meetings, and professional learning. Uh, this calendar is a response to the continued shortage of substitute teachers that has impacted teacher preparation times. It, every day we're taking uh, prep periods away from teachers, getting them to use coverage for uh, staff and goes a small way to returning some of that collaboration to us. Um, so uh, the major objection came from Southwest Tech, the amount of half days. You know, we believe we have a solution that would allow our students to continue there on Wednesday and utilize our late bus. Um, so I, I don't foresee any problems going forward. 
Any questions, comments on the calendar you would like the superintendent to give? I would like to know how many students participated in the GIST program, both in Arlington and yeah. so, You know, it's not just the uh, this program that we're expanding and we'll continue to expand the opportunities on Wednesdays. Um, you know, as you know, there's the Bennington Aces program for, for, um, for tennis. Uh, the Bennington Rec Center Winter Swim Camp is on Wednesdays. The Bromley Outing Club, which is the GIST program. Uh, the ADAPT Sports Center, which is also part of the Bromley Outdoor Center. Um, um, Prospect and uh, arts. And there's an art studio involved. Um, gymnastics program involved. Uh, all on Wednesday afternoons is approximately... Um, uh, not County Arlington right now, approximately between uh, our partner in the Berkshire YMCA, 75 to 80 students on Wednesday at the YMCA. So I don't, um, I don't, it's not just the ski program and, and, it, and it just, and we hope to expand even more opportunities available on those Wednesdays. So what is the total number with all those programs? Are? I don't have a total number in front of me. I just have to use the programs that we, that we have. It wouldn't be consistent on every Wednesday, anyway. Every Wednesday, but does the calendar, um, you know, what the number is for the student days for the calendar? Uh, 108, which is what, yeah, we do. Yeah, state Vermont, um, state statute requires a minimum of 175. And, um, if and I, I absolutely understand that you are, have a collaboration with all the superintendents to mm -hmm. work on this. Um, so my next question is: If this is the calendar, what are the hours for every school? It's a different question, but it goes with the calendar. What are the hours of operation for each of the elementary schools, and do they differ in length of time? So we've never put hours of operation on the calendar. But I, right. Yeah, but I, I'm thinking it as I'm thinking this because the board is- I'll be glad to have um, a future meeting the next bring it that. I do not have everybody's errors. I mean, they're pretty yeah. close. Yeah, they're close, imagine. but I don't- The board approves the hours of yeah. the day. The superintendent comes yeah. on the calendar. I'll be glad to provide the hour of operations, but I don't want to speak to it off the top of my head. This, oh, yep, the next yeah. Um, okay, so when it comes to half days or just in general, snow days, are we still looking at virtual learn, like virtual? No, the state does not approve virtual learning. Yeah. After the after the COVID pandemic is over, declared over. Yeah, so we're not allowed to do that. <laughs> and, but it's a question that's often frequently. Well, you did it during COVID. Why? Yeah. Why can't you do it now? But we we do not have that option to do a. Okay virtual emergency day yeah so we would have to use a. it would be considered a snow day then right okay yep Thank you. now it gets out access like this year there were no snow days there's no power <laughs> right. sorry right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 so with that said <laughs> item c is the last day of school for this year which is probably the most frequently asked question that i've been receiving uh since uh, everyone thinks it's the last snow day. What I um, asked the MEU board to do last night, and I'm asking this board to do today, is to the last student day to be Friday, June 16th. It will be more than 175 days. It will be less than the 180. Uh, Monday, the 19th, is the Juneteenth holiday. So I really don't see the educational value to bring students back for Tuesday and Wednesday. So I'm asking the board to vote to let the last student day and when I say it's be more than 175 or less than 180, it's different for some of the schools because some did have a no power day. I mean, we all had snow days, and so it's going to be even different for Arlington. They didn't have all the snow days that we did. I'll be meeting with that board tomorrow night. Uh, we've done this the past few years. Um, so the 19th will be the holiday, and then the 20th and 21st will be professional learning days for the staff. But the last day for students would be if uh, you. Uh, care to make that a motion and approve that to be the last day of school. Can we make a motion to 
Second. Uh, second. Any discussion? I think just state law is at the 175, right? Right, and we will be over that. Yeah. So, yeah. so I do want to I do want to caution anybody that might be home and listen. Um, uh, Hopefully we will not have an emergency weather day between now and then, but we are over one so we could easily absorb one more day and still hit 175 of all schools, some schools. Pay. And uh, I still don't know what Arlington's going to vote tomorrow, so uh, we won't make an official announcement that the last day of school is for students is June 16th until I have a vote in from all boards. So just a quick question. Um, when would have been the last we did if we didn't approve this when we were looking at ten months? Uh, Twenty second thing. So it was the fourteenth was last school and then fifteenth and seventeenth would have been eight. So that's the next year. So we would have been yeah. So we're gonna come back Tuesday for the kids then. Yeah. And it's, then it's, it's, then it's professional not professional Tuesday, learning after that. Yeah. Thursday. So we're just taking one kid day off the table. Right. Clarifying, this is the last day, student day. Student day, student just day. Friday the 16th. The 19th is a holiday now for Juneteenth. So uh, June 20th and 21st, that Tuesday and Wednesday, will be staff professional learning days. Okay, so. Full days? Yes. But the contract says 180 yeah. student days and then eight days additional for teachers. Yeah, so we can have one student day. Yeah. And then one. Teacher day, right? Oh, one oh. student, one teacher day. Yeah. That's the one. Well, remember, the teacher days aren't all at the end of the year. No, They've been doing yeah. professional learning deals eight days of oh. They were here before. We're going to the calendar. Yeah. Right. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Oh. Any opposed? Any abstentions? The DMR report is contingent on what we discussed before. So I have no okay. for other end of my report. Uh, and then moving into item 10, principal's report. I asked uh, the Powell Elementary School principal to come before you tonight and give you uh, a report on her school. This is Bethany George. George. So that's how I tell myself to remember. Lord. That's why I just flipped up there. So, Bethany, welcome. Hi, George. Um, <laughs> Thank you. So, I always tell the kids, I always tell the kids that too when they first were, you know, coming in. How, what's your name again? I'm like, it sounds like George, Miss Lorge. And they were great. Um, so I'm currently three fourths of my way through my first year uh, here in the SVSU and at Pownal. And it's also my first journey in elementary. So, uh, for those of you who don't know, my, my background is middle school and some high school as well as all secondary. And so, uh, I sometimes ask myself what took me so long to get to elementary school. Um, and then I usually get some kind of sickness that's from elementary school. <laughs> and then I'm like, oh, goodness gracious, I think I've had it all this year. Um, yeah, it's been back to back to. Yeah, that's right. If I had Friday, I was in the urgent care with strep. So, um, a strep, which I haven't had since I was in elementary school. So, um, <laughs> It's been a journey uh, in that regards, but I have loved my time um, as an elementary principal. One of the things uh, I took a picture of one day that just was like, I'm in Vermont, is the kids lining up to empty their trays after lunch and they're all in snow pants. They're just swishing <laughs> up to empty their trays, <laughs> swishing to line up, and then they go outside to the recess. Um, because where were you before Vermont? San Antonio, Texas. So so probably, so probably not snow. Pants. I grew up in North Adams, but obviously I don't remember. I don't remember having so much fun at recess and snow pants. Um, but they are. Uh, they get so excited by birthday pencils that I deliver. They get excited to see your face, you know, as they walk into the building. Um, they're just they're top notch. Panel kiddos are top notch, and I've um, really been grateful to be there um, this year. And we still have we still have some time to go. Um, one of the campus goals that we had this year was to um, open our doors and have our community come in a little bit more. Um, we've been missing that since before COVID. And so we have a phenomenal PTG. I have a great president who is hungry and excited to um, take on big events. 
So in Halloween time, we did a trunk or treat that uh, if you ask the high school principal, Mr. Payne, um, completely clogged up all of the area around the tunnel and behind. Um, great turnout, hundreds of community members that came out. Uh, we did a Pownal Express at Christmas time, which was a take on um, the Polar Express. We worked with Dufour and had buses. Uh, you got a ticket when you arrived into the train station. You got on the buses. We did a tour around Powell where you could see Christmas lights. Um, you came back and then the, the gym was set up with hot chocolate and um, games. Um, you could sit with Santa that was a volunteer. It was just, it was a great community event. It was the first time we've ever done it. And there are some tweaks that we'll have for next year, but overall was a really great success. Uh, we did basket bingo, which was a return after many years. Again, a phenomenal turnout. Uh, for our community um, and, and just had a, a, a great time with that as well. That was a first for me too, where I came from, we did not do basket bingo. Didn't really understand it at first, but our school donates uh, baskets that were um, prizes for each of the games. And it was wonderful to see our community put in for that too. Uh, our upcoming event is Spring Fest, which is May 13th. And so if you're in the area, you wanna stop by, there'll be vendors, there'll be games, there'll be activities um, throughout the day. Uh, and we'll probably have some Mother's Day activities because I believe it's the day before Mother's Day. Um, in our school, uh, we were the recipient of a Cliff Grant, which has brought writers and illustrators to our campus. They've given the students um, free books each time they've come to visit. Uh, we have Bubble Guy. This is also new to me, elementary school. Bubble Guy who's coming on Friday in the morning, which um, is uh, talks a lot about science and gets the kids excited by, you know, large bubble creations. Um, so they're, they're quite excited about that. Um, I brought a Friday funny into our every week announcement. So if you go on our Powell Facebook page, I always feature a kiddo who's turned in like a, a dad joke um, and they get to go on the announcements and read these jokes. And so you have little kindergartners that get up and we practice, you know, speaking <laughs> and delivery and those kind of things. Um, so every Friday we feature someone uh, to do that. Do you have a dad joke for us? Yeah. From last week? Uh, the one last week was uh, along the lines of why does a nurse always have a red pen? And so that she can draw blood. Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Our nurse loved Very it. Good. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, I take a picture. I take a picture of them doing it, and then I contact their parents and I let them know how you know, great they did and send them the picture. And uh, yeah, it's been, it's been a lot of fun. Um, and there's some really good ones and also some, <laughs> some, yeah, like, uh, they're, they're always funny and they're cute and they deliver on but, uh, the kids have actually really gotten into creating their own dad jokes. So oh. now some of the ones that students present to me, uh, where I'm like, let's maybe work on a different one. <laughs> it's a lot of times they have tried to develop their own. So they've taken something they think is funny. Um, but they, I <laughs> admire their, their efforts and some of them are fantastic. Um, we have incentives that I have really enjoyed this year with the principal, which include um, my, my background is playing basketball, playing basketball through college. And so instead of playing horse, we play pommel. Um, and they have to, you know, I always win. Like, I, I am still undefeated. Um, <laughs> and I will also kind of rub that into uh, the announcements mm -hmm. of, you know, people who will like maybe get like one letter ahead of me and then they end up losing and they think, you know, they're still winning. So I have to make sure everybody understands that the principal is still undefeated. Um, so uh, we did we did some snowshoeing. Our, our grounds are great for snowshoe, snowshoeing. And so when we had some snow, um, we did that. We'll do some hiking incentives. Um, the little ones really like lunch with me and that's entertaining. Also a perk of the job is sitting down in the conversation that kindergartners like to have over lunch. Um, it's a lot of what's your favorite, what's your favorite, you know, color or movie. Um, and so I've enjoyed that as well. I got out one of the early releases to go skiing with the kiddos. Uh, we started just at Pommel, which has not been there in many years. And so I had a volunteer who really wanted to spearhead that and she took that um, on and we had uh, maybe about 15, kiddos, 15 to 20 kiddos who um, took part in GIST every Wednesday, and I, uh, I took advantage and, and stuck out a little early and met them at the mountain and did some runs with them, which was one of the highlights of my year so far. 
um, we've done a sugar run after Halloween where the, the students did a run around campus and we have a relay recess, which is um, fundraising for Relay for Life coming up as well. Uh, we're gonna be a similar um, track around the campus and um, we have a former student who's leading that along with my PE teacher, Mr. Kip. We brought back our Thanksgiving luncheon. Uh, we have um, Pownal Valley and Pownal Fire Trucks visited us for safety, and we actually at Christmas time named uh, the Pownal Valley Fire Trucks, and there were four of them, and you can tell that it was around the holidays because their names are Rudolph, Old Red, Clifford, and Sparky. So just like the clouds, <laughs> just like the clouds they made little um, signs to go on the side of the trucks. Um, we... Uh, have gotten out on field trips again. Some, you know, that was a, a big uh, push for the, the teachers that they really wanted to take their students out again. So we've been to Hildean. Today they went to the Berkshire Museum in Pittsfield. Uh, we went to the Veterans Home in Bennington. Ioka Valley, uh, Otter Creek is coming up. And we have done frequent trips, probably about three grade levels now, have gone to Hopkins Forest in Williamstown with Williams College. Um, our focus instructionally, uh, we have a great program, reading program that our teachers have bought into, um, we'll call it the Hill, uh, Hill Science of Reading. Um, and when you have, if you come and do walks, you can see fantastic instruction going on in a time when intervention and especially early intervention is just so important, but also in our older grade levels where we have um, students who are definitely, um, you know, having having to make up that time during COVID. Uh, we have had robotics in sixth grade, so a lot of that was in that title funding. Um, we've had robotics in our sixth grade class. Uh, we've done drumming on campus as well. That was a, a nice loud day. And then um, our our half days for us were very beneficial. So it allowed a lot of time for our staff to um, connect with each other, to um, spend some time just taking a, a, a breath. But one of the things that I also um, brought in because I did see a need that parents and grandparents didn't, um, you know, they didn't always know what they were gonna do for those half days for their students. And so our paraprofessionals really stepped up. And on those early release days, we did like an in-house after school. And it was, you know, some, it was some time of, of schoolwork, it was crafting, it was um, games. It was connection, and I was really grateful for our, our paraprofessionals as well that they did a, a service for our students, um, especially those parents who really couldn't get there until a normal dismissal time of three or three o'clock, three thirty. Um, teacher appreciation is coming up in May. We have luncheon scheduled for our teaching staff, uh, or some kind of snack or celebration. And the last thing that I want to just really highlight is for me personally, um, you know, I, I attended Williams, graduated from Williams, and uh, we've started to bring back a connection with Williams. So a lot of Hopkins forest field trips, um, we've started Friday lunch pals that come. So they come to the school on Fridays and just sit with the kids and have conversation with them and talk to them. Um, and then we also have student teachers who are on our campus. And so it's the start, hopefully, going into next year where we can really um, have some planned events, um, whether it's sports related, recess, um, in the classroom. And that's been the kids, the, the students at Pano have really enjoyed that as well. Um, I'm just so appreciative of my time here. It has, there has been, you know, growing pains like any transition uh, coming from a very large school district to a very small school district um, has been a learning curve for me. Uh, but I'm just, I've just been very grateful for the, the panel community, for welcoming me back, uh, for the board, for central office, um, always offering help and guidance. And uh, I'm really excited to enter into next year and to build on, on what we started to do. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I really wanted to be pictures and all that too. <laughs> Thank you for having all these opportunities for them. Yeah, thank you. I hope yeah. it grows. I hope it grows. Yeah. All right. Uh, I guess we're, we're in. I'm we're in, in four. We're in four. We're back four. to item four. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did you do policies? We did do policies. We did do policies. Okay. Okay. Um, so. 
policy number 5027 to adopt policy number 5087 threats and disruption to school operations. We get a motion. Motion to adopt. And a second. second. Any discussion? Jim, I just had a I had a question as I was reading through this. Um, it's it talks a lot about uh, bombs or toxic substance. But that's not the only disruption that could happen in a school day. So to <laughs> Paul saying I'm gonna do something terrible today, it's not one of those. Is that is that is that part of this? Is that part of a separate policy? I think that we should call it I hate to say big bombs here. One policy oh, but that's in here, but yeah. it's more if but it seems to be very explicit of, of either bomb or something toxic or potentially harmful being placed yep. there, but it's not necessarily I'm gonna come with a with a rifle yep. into something terrible. Yeah. I think that policy. So this is, I mean, this is the issue of our communication by any means of a threat that any unarized toxic or hazard material be placed with people placed in school and danger. So you're, you're asking me, is there something just for making a threat posed to a right. physical device? A threat of any kind. Yeah, right here it's talking about a threat of a device. I believe there is, but I don't want to. Okay. Thank you. Guns Thank you. And weapons. I think it's weapons yeah. and something that that needs to come to see. So I um, bring that back to the policy right before. I had a, one question about procedures. So I'm asking if, are we moving away from administrative? Regulations. No, we would write that after the policy is adopted, then we write the administrative regs once because this there are boys that may not adopt it and then it gets kicked back. So then we bring it write that in regs and then bring that back to the policy. So does that become item seven procedure? Is my question. It's the last yeah, page. Yeah. yeah, it would be under that. Okay. So those will be drafted after all boards have adopted and brought back to the board. Okay, so we have a motion to adopt on the board. Second. You're going to bring my question back to the policy committee. Mm -hmm. Would that mean that we don't vote tonight? No, you would still, still vote, vote to adopt this. We yes. just get clarification yeah. from the policy. Okay. okay. Uh, all of those in favor? Right. Any opposed? Any abstention? Okay. Very nice task. Second. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? <laughs> Any opposed? Any abstention? Okay. There, uh, my superintendent, Fourth D, administrative update. The action requested is to appoint the interim vice principal from Wally Stock Elementary School, and I'll uh, refer to HR Director Nick Gall to read the nomination. Yeah, so that would be our current reading specialist, Kim Weber. Um, as the interim assistant principal. I'll start. So we need a motion to yeah. move Kim Weber to associate principal at Molly Stark. All those in favor? Oh, I'll oh. make the motion. I'll make the motion. I'll make the motion. I'll second. Interim. 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 Mm -hmm. I heard the motion. Second. 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 All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Extension. Okay. Thank you. Great. Uh, and with that, chairs report. Which is no? Well, so just to give a, a few updates as to what the, the chair has been up to, uh, 
we are nearly through with the support staff negotiations. So that went very smoothly. I think there was a lot of, a lot of goodwill on both sides of that negotiating table. So that was nice to report. Um, and just to, to reiterate what we've been hearing all along, just the, the uh, amount of cooperation and enthusiasm that the staff and Paula Stark have shown and sort of lifting the, the school out of a challenging situation. So that's very heartening I think, for the board to hear as well. Um, so again, the school year has not been without its challenges, but at the end of the, each and every day, we have a really dedicated group of, of staff members and teachers and other professionals in the buildings that make this continue to be about the kids. And, mm -hmm. and that's what's most important and what's most healthy to see for them, for sure. Um, that's all the chair has. Um, just a question on the panel open seat. Any we have no applicants and no the time expires today. Oh. So you will not be able to pull that seat because the statute uh, 30 days. 30, 30 days from uh, when we notify the select board and we have five days no room, so it's really like 35 days, which the night's counting today or Wednesday, but yeah. So get out an individual interested, but um, did not formally commit. Now's the time to make our move against town. That's it. And then item 12 on the agenda, FYI, there's budget status report and student enrollment report in the packet. I think that exhausts the agenda. So can we get a motion to adjourn? Uh, so I second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? Any abstentions? All right. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Scott, thanks for a great job. Yeah, great thank job. You. Great job. Cat TV is celebrating 30 years of community media. Help support Cat TV's next 30 years by becoming a member today. Your membership will help us continue covering meaningful local content. Thank you for supporting your local community media station.